And that's what climate change is about. It is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. The ability of CO2 to do the heavy work of creating a climate catastrophe is almost nil at this point. The price of oil has been artificially elevated to the point of insanity. That's not how you power a modern industrial system. The ultimate goal of this renewable energy you know, plan is to reach the exact same point that we're at now. You know who's tried that? Germany. Seven straight days of no wind for Germany. Uh, their factories are shutting down. They really do act like weather didn't happen prior to like 1910. Today is Friday. That's right, Greta, you pint-sized antagonist. It is Friday, and this is our own personal Friday protest, the Climate Realism Show, episode number 106. Today's topic, U.S. surface temperature measurements redo. Still not fit for purpose. I'm your host, Anthony Watt, Senior Fellow for Environment and Climate at the Heartland Institute. Joining me today are our regular panelists, Dr. H. Sterling Bennett, Director of the Robinson Center at the Heartland Institute, and Linnea Lucan, Robinson Center Research Fellow. Welcome, guys. Good to see you again. Great to have you back. Yeah, good Good to have you back from the great adventure. <laughs> the great, great adventure. adventure from the Midwest to the West. Yeah, it, you could title it Anthony's Not So Excellent Adventure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so on this episode, we're going to look again at the sad state of the surface temperature network in the United States. Says I did another trip last week across the United States to get a fresh look at what these stations are looking like. Yeah, I, of course, this follows a, a 2009 where we did detailed inspections of the station and photographic evidence and showed all of the different problems that they have. And then again, in 2022, we did another report. In 2009, 89% of the stations were out of compliance. In 2022, on the second round, that number rose to 96%. And the uh, with the as with the two previous efforts, you know, we're seeing the same thing from what I learned last week. We'll get to that in a minute. But first, we're going to start off with the crazy climate news. Some of the nuttiest, eye rolling, eye watering stuff that's been on the internet this week. And yep, there's a bunch. First of all, the ever alarmed a guardian. Yes, predatory loans are now a reason, or, or because of climate change. I mean, is there nothing climate change can't do? It's causing bankers to make predatory loans for poor people. <laughs> well, um, in this story in particular, it's kind of the same old, you know, poor people are hurt worse by heat waves kind of argument. It goes something like this. It goes, climate change is making heat waves worse. Therefore, people have higher electricity bills, which is forcing them to go get these payday loans, which are quick turnaround, super high interest loans that um, end up entrapping a lot of poor people into this like cycle of borrowing to pay their bills uh, over and over again and borrowing to pay interest. And so the, the argument that they're making here is that climate change because heat waves is making this more common. I don't know if they make a very compelling argument for that being the case actually. Um, but it's uh, that's, I, that's their framework for it. Yeah. But yeah. I, I think for stupid things, we don't have to give their framework for it. <laughs> you, 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 you claim we don't know. We do know that there's not more heat waves. So if there aren't more heat waves, they can't be causing uh, the higher electric bills that they're suffering. Oh, gosh, I can think of something that is causing higher electric bills uh, for the poor and everyone else alike. Uh, government policies to fight climate change. Uh, ending the use of cheap fossil fuels for electric power and replacing it with expensive intermittent uh, wind and solar power. So yeah. uh, there is a cause for these poor people uh, suffering predatory payday, payday loans. It's just not what they're trying to blame climate change. It's climate policies as uh, it, you know, it just reverses the cause and effect just like it does with so many things when they claim climate change is causing something and it's actually government po policies causing something. Yeah, just like liberalism, climate change policy ruins everything it touches, pretty much. 
Um, yeah, there was there was one line in there that kind of puzzled me a bit more even than some of the others, and that was they they imply that um, that Hispanic households are even more influenced by this situation because they take more outdoor jobs. That doesn't really follow that their air conditioning yeah, bill would be higher than it, other people. So yeah, I don't really know it. what that had to do with anything. In my experience uh, with a wife from Venezuela and lots of family from Venezuela, Spanish people are more accustomed to heat than, than the average Anglo uh, and uh, don't complain as much outdoors about heat, at least when I go to parties and things like that. Yeah. I'm sweating. They're sweating too, but they ain't, they ain't saying anything about it. Um, and I don't know how working outdoors, uh, makes you more prone to predatory loans, you know, that you're on the street directing traffic or let, you know, putting down, um, asphalt and you look over and you see a predatory loan, uh, a, a quick cash and you say, Oh, I think I'll go there today and put myself in hock. Yeah. Well, it's you know, just, the next story that the Guardian's going to write about this is that the climate change is causing people to default on home loans. Well, you know, the answer to your question, Anthony, you, you, you started with, is there anything climate change can't cause? And the answer to your question is no, not for them. Yep. Yep. There's nothing it can't cause when you have an imaginative, um, uninformed mind. Okay. So now the next thing, get this. These two stories ran on the same day. One was NBC News and the other was CBS News, both bastions of in, of, of um, journalistic integrity, right? So one of them says, melting polar ice is slowing the Earth's rotation with possible consequences for timekeeping. Oh, no. Then, as CBS News reports, Earth is spinning faster than it used to. Clocks might have to skip a second to keep up. Mm -hmm. Now, when I first saw this, I thought this had to be a joke. This was, you know, an April 1st joke left over or something. No, it's real. And we've got the links to the two stories to prove it. The first story at CBS News, or at, pardon me, NBC News, shows, there it is, right there. Polar rights is causing the Earth to slow. And then over at CBS News, there it is. It just, it's like, the media has no clue what they're talking about. They will regurgitate anything some so-called expert will put out and with no idea as to the larger picture of things. You know, it's all with, about with no, anymore. With no notion of checking facts, of confirming that what one person who happens to have a degree you know, some kind of letters behind his name says, does it correspond to the to, to data and evidence or is it just his opinion? In which case opinions are, are you know, are worth, you know, a dime a, do a dozen and they're worth about that much. Um, it's clear they don't check each other. It, I mean, it's clear that they're not checking with each other when they do these stories or they, you know, wouldn't have run two opposite stories. But, you know, maybe they're thinking, well, which one's more alarming? that the earth's speeding up or the earth is slowing down. And one of them decided one way and one decided the other way. And it, it, there you have it. But this is typical. This is typical climate crap. Is the monsoon getting worse or better? Are hurricanes, you know, getting more frequent and severe or not? Uh, snowstorms. Oh, it's, it, it's harsher snowstorms. Cl no, it's climate change. The end of snow is climate change. Like you say, everything, even polar opposites, are caused by climate change simultaneously at the same time. The Earth is both slowing and speeding up at the same time, which means, as far as I can tell, it's not changing at all. Well, yeah, it's, it's and to your zero. point, <laughs> to your point about you know them not checking against each other, Sterling. I don't think that some of these writers check like three paragraphs up in their own story. The uh, NBC one says, you know, that this is that if uh, the Earth's rotation is changing speed or whatever, then this is unprecedented. And it's a climate change is affecting something that scientists long considered um, unchanging and constant. And then a couple paragraphs down, it says something along the lines of scientists have always known that <laughs> the Earth's <laughs> speed. The, ro the speed of our Earth's rotation has changed over millennia and blah, 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 blah. It's like, get, 
I don't know if it's just lazy or dumb. <laughs> oh. I, I don't know. It's not good, though. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, so the next topic is global warming is making the ocean cold. Yes, that's right. After years of telling us the oceans are having heat waves and getting overheated mm -hmm. and everything's dying because they're, the oceans are boiling, according to the UN guy, now it's getting cold. Yeah. Right? It's causing cold water ocean upwelling. Uh, and is that bad or good? It, you know, yeah. it, it, let's just, for the sake of argument, just for the sake of argument, the oceans got hotter. Okay. Is that bad or good? That's that, you know, we can say, we can talk about a fact. Maybe the oceans got hotter as a fact. Um, that doesn't make it bad or good it, or better or worse than it was when it was cooler. Have the oceans gotten cooler? That can be established as a fact one way or the other. That doesn't yeah. make it bad or good or better or worse than what it was before it was cooler. In, in, in either case, all they're always constantly claiming is that any change at all from the current status quo is catastrophe. And we know that's not true. Right. Yeah. Now here's the, non here's the fun part. The very next day, the New York times runs a piece talking about how the ocean's heat is causing problems. Yeah. yeah. We don't. And of course we don't see it because it's in the ocean, you know, um, the, the 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 oceans are evidently like that product icy hot it's hot and and cold in uh in rep you know in uh different orders having right having a senior moment there right yeah it is it's just amazing so anyway it just you know constantly constantly back and forth with the media they don't seem to pay attention to what they're talking about whatsoever getting some Comments? dead air the death yeah no I, it's okay <laughs> 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 well, we i'm reading our our comments here we have some good mm -hmm. we've got some good questions coming up and we have some good audience members who uh have uh funny things to say we always have the funniest audience yeah when i worked radio they, they they say that dead air is the death of radio and it's like all of a sudden nothing's going on it's like well i was just talking i'm not gonna butt back in <laughs> like that's ever stopped me before yeah. uh, a little bit of dead air is okay on a live stream i think <laughs> give our audience something to chew on <laughs> what else do yeah. we have on the docket here anthony yeah um so this week, the, uh, the climate alarmists went ballistic over the floods in Dubai. Yes, it rained a lot in one day, six and a half inches or more, and there was some flooding. And of course, the media picked it up. And oh no, it's disaster! Climate change must have done it. And of course, people like Bill McKibben, who don't have any technological understanding of anything related to weather or climate, immediately rushed to judgment and said, "It's climate change. It had to be, you know, because climate change is making everything worse, right?" Um, so, um, just unbelievable amounts of, uh, rhetoric rain, coming out ra there. rain comes to a desert disaster. Right. So here's the thing at climaterealism.com. We, we put this stuff down every day. We come back and say, here's the facts, Jack. And so we wrote this article. No, if I rain bomb has no ties to climate change, first of all, Anything that happens in the space of a few hours is weather, not climate. Climate change is weather averaged over 30 years. That's it. There's nothing else. And now, there's no trend in floods like that. Hmm? There's no trend in floods like that. There's no 30 year increasing trend of high weather events happening in that country. Yeah. Well, if you if you use their logic, they went from zero floods for the last 75 years to one gigantic flood. And so the slope must be huge, right? <laughs> We found we found one of those tipping points finally. Yeah. Anyway, it's just crazy. So the thing about it is, is that not only is it weather, not climate, but um, we went in and showed that even the IPCC says there is no emergent. Um, there's no emergent signature of flooding due to heavy rainfall. 
in the record. It's further down on this. If you scroll down, there's a table. Keep going. By the way, weather models forecasted this thing uh, a few days in advance. Right there, that table. That is table 12.12 .12 from the IPC sixth assessment report. And the section on heavy precipitation and pluvial flood shows white to the right of it. Basically saying, we haven't detected it now. We don't anticipate detecting it at least until 2050. We might detect it after 2050. Absolutely no detection whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So it's bogus. Yep. It's <laughs> Bill McKibben, if you're watching, you're wrong again. You know, well, he's he's uh, he's like should be an honorary member if he's not a member of World Weather Attribution. Right. Where, that organization drives us up a wall. They're yeah. just the worst. We have climate models that we compare to fantasy of what the weather would be like contraindicated as we imagine it and mm -hmm. it tells us something real uh well yeah right yeah um it, it's i i'm utterly convinced that world weather attribution the only reason why they exist is to give headlines like you know research shows this xyz storm couldn't have existed without climate change um anthony i have a question for you that i think the audience would be very interested in knowing. So if so if if Dubai is running their like cloud seeding programs and it seems mm -hmm. like they were already kind of set to have a pretty major storm system come through. Does cloud seeding even really make that big of a difference when there already is a big weather system coming in because it seems to me like logically it wouldn't make as much sense as you know, if you're only going to get a little bit of rain or hardly any rain, doing some nuclei seeding in order to take what humidity does exist at that altitude and get it to form rain. Like that seems like that would work better than throwing seeds or throwing uh, nuclei material into a pre-existing like major rainstorm. It doesn't seem like that would accelerate it that much. Well, basically what cloud seeding does is an enhancement to already predicted precipitation. Uh, it does not create rain out of nothingness. First of all, you have to have the, uh, you have to have precipitable water in the atmosphere. Uh, you have to have the conditions for rain. What cloud seeding does is it provides additional condensation nuclei, small little particles, typically uh, silver iodide or in the, um, Sierra Nevada, they use propane crystals. Uh, they eject propane from these propane tanks and these sprayers into the atmosphere, which make these tiny little propane crystals, which help enhance the snow. But you might get an extra yield of 10 to 20%. You're not gonna get an extra yield of 200%. Um, and so, yeah, the, um, the cloud seeding that they were doing over at UAE, which they admitted to that they had been doing a couple of days beforehand, seeing the system coming in, might have added 10 or 20 percent. Interestingly enough, the original story that, that I had cited when I said, Bill McKibben, you're wrong, disappeared. They basically took the whole cloud seeding thing uh, from this one uh, media outlet and disappeared it. Uh, and then all of a sudden, the people over at the UAE cloud seeding program are saying, oh, no, we never did that. We never did that. Even though we've got a person on record from that same program going out there saying, yeah, we did cloud seeding for two days beforehand. We sent uh, six airplane trips up to do that. It's Boy, that's bizarre. not going to fuel conspiracies at all. <laughs> Love it when they do that. Well, at least it's yeah. not the contrails. Yeah. Anyway, there's. Uh, anyway. Next up, we have uh, this cartoon. Now, I, I found this hilarious. I've always thought that these Tesla trucks look like something out of the video, the music video from the 80s, Money for Nothing, um, <laughs> because all these sharp-edged you know, things were in this video, sharp-edged houses and vehicles and stuff. But this person here who posted this meme up on Facebook says, Tesla is announcing a new cyber bus. And of course, that looks perfect for, you know, the continuation first of, all, of that thing, right? <laughs> that first of all, I want a something? tread, I want a tread track vehicle. That would be cool. I do want that. Uh, second, I will defend the cyber truck to my dying breath. I think it's cool. Maybe it's not as good as a gas powered truck. Um, I've seen it. I've, I have seen some, 
um, sources that I trust more than Tesla themselves and uh, more than like the government and stuff running tests with these things. And they actually seem to work pretty well. Um, they're even doing a little bit of minor, you know, like dirt road travel and stuff, and they seem to handle it. So I've seen uh, one of the funniest uses I've seen of them is them hauling generators for uh, oil field applications. Yeah. <laughs> they're running around in Midland hauling <laughs> generators for like wireline and stuff. And that, that I found very funny. Um, but I, I, it's so different than any other vehicle on the road. Um, maybe it's just my brain has been trained by video games. Yeah, exactly. To like the low mm. poly halo warthog look, but that's, uh, I like them. They look, yeah. they look neat. They just don't look like trucks and i look at that bed and i say it doesn't look like much of yeah. a bed frankly look like it looks like you're driving a wedgie yeah. anyway um by the way this the cyber stuff. bus that they've you're got over the here uh, you know it what's really the, the what they have for backup in case the batteries die in that cyber bus is they've got a bunch of jawas um little um <laughs> you know hamster wheels in there right yeah <laughs> oh my goodness okay so one last thing, we got this video. We got this video, speaking of electric cars, uh, that our uh, Vice President Jim Lakely found. And this video is, wow, it's really something. It basically shows, uh, it looks like it's getting hit by missiles or something, you know? The sound on this is incredible. Um, let's see if we can watch this video of the, um, the EVs or death traps kind of thing. There it is. That wow, was a, wow, that, that was, wow. Is there any evidence that was a Tesla truck hauling explosives? Uh, you know, what impresses me about that, more than the explosions, is like the jet flame shooting out the top of that thing constantly. It looks like a, a jet engine flame pouring out. But uh, it certainly wants, it, it certainly encouraged me to park it, to park one of those things in my garage under my bedroom. Yeah, it's just amazing. It, it lithium. I, I don't know if you guys ever did these. Did you go to chemistry class in high school where you got sure. to throw like sodium and water and watch it explode? Well, that's yeah, basically yeah. what's going on here with lithium. Although it does it by it doesn't even need water. It works with the atmosphere and heat. I I just want to assure the folks that no, this is not a video of uh, the Ukraine or Russia or the Gaza Strip. Right now, this is a modern city with electric vehicles on it. That's that's what I want to see. Yep. You talk about a traffic delay. Look at look none of you know all this traffic on the other side. Nobody's going anywhere. Right. No one wants it to get kinda, close to that thing. It kind of looks like they were hauling, or there was a car, a vehicle involved in this that was hauling some kind of gas canisters. If you see the barrels that are flying off in different directions that that's a recipe for disaster right there the gas yeah. burns up pretty quick though if it doesn't have uh, something it's attached to and yeah anyway it's just like a lot of fiber and and plastic and uh graphite being blown all over the place to me yeah Right. Potassium thrown in a snowbank. Oh my gosh, that'd be a good time. You know, uh, it's just amazing. Talk we about are driving pain. around. 
we are driving around you know, with these EVs that have lithium in them, ticking time bombs. It's not a matter of if or when. It's a ma not a matter of if, it's when, really. I mean, these things are eventually, something's going to puncture it. They're going to be in an accident. The water's going to get in. Something. Lithium batteries generally are not designed for long-term use. And even with all this supposed armoring they put on them, we still have these kind of problems. It is uh, catastrophic, to say the least. They can't put it out. The fire departments are helpless. They can't put water on it. Foam is yeah, marginally successful. But the thing's just going to burn itself out no matter what. All you can do, basically, is sit back and enjoy the show. You know, and, and of course, the armoring they put around them is what makes them difficult to service and replace. You know, you, one battery cell goes out. You can't just replace the one battery cell because it's in this pack, this armored yep. pack. So, uh, yeah, well, you know, if, if this had happened in a desert, they might have gotten that fire out quicker, sand. Yeah. Okay. So, um we're going to go on to our main topic now. Now, this is from 2009. You folks all know about the work I've been doing traveling the nation. Volunteers have helped out a tremendous amount as well. Looking at how NOAA has been citing these weather stations out there that are used for the surface temperature record. And uh, in 2009, when I surveyed almost 1,000 stations, we found that 89% of them were not properly cited based on NOAA's own rules. They have a basic rule, a 100-foot rule. If you have something such as asphalt, concrete, a building, an air conditioner, whatever, within 100 feet of the station, it's going to bias it. But don't do it. And yet, even though they have a hard and fast rule about this, the bottom line is, is when you go and look at all these stations, they don't care. They're right next to heat sources, right next to them. I mean, we, we found some blatant examples. So they're 2009. Then in 2022, I did another review. We decided to go look at some of the older stations that we'd first surveyed. And then the number went up. I looked at 128 different stations additional on top of the existing stations. Now from 89 to 96% don't meet the standards published by NOAA. 100 foot rule. How hard is that? Well, I figured, you know what? I have a, another thing I had to do this year. So I turned it into another trip. And this past week, I drove from Minneapolis all the way to Reno, Nevada, looking at stations along the way. And um, I have a slideshow to show you. I started off with the first station at the Minneapolis. National Weather Service office. You can see it right here. They have a WSR-88 radar out there. Um, you know, it looks nice. They have over on the left side, they've got a dome there for releasing weather balloons. But just up the driveway, here's their weather station. And boom, right next to asphalt and a building and so forth. And, you know, they try to make it well-sided, but they can't. They just don't have the space. That's the problem. It's hard to and, get perspective from that picture, Anthony. Can you can you describe to us how far it is off the asphalt in the building? Okay, so it's about 35 feet over to the asphalt and then about another 40 feet over to the building. So it's within 100 feet. Yeah, for both. Yeah. So let's go to the next slide. Here's another one. Um, this one at a residence. Now, here's the crazy thing about climate change measured in the United States. It's really an ad hoc network. And when I say ad hoc, I mean, these things are in the craziest of places. But this is somebody's backyard. This is uh, in Iowa, or uh, maybe, maybe it's in Minnesota, I forget. But bottom line is, this particular station is in a person's backyard. They're a cooperative observer. They're a volunteer. And so they're responsible for measuring the temperature each day and writing it down and sending it into NOAA. So the problem is, is that what kind of quality control do you get here in an environment like this? Answer is none. You don't, and it's well within the 100 foot rule. Um, I mean, it's it's just amazing how bad some of these stations can be. It looks like it's driveway and automobile adjacent, patio adjacent, concrete yep. adjacent, house adjacent. Yeah, here's another picture. Go to the next slide, Andy. Okay, it's right next to a driveway and a building and a deck. And it's all of these things. A lone stone wall. Yeah, a lone stone wall. 
This is St. Peter, Minnesota, by the way. Okay, so the next one at our favorite topic, sewage treatment plants. Yes, a bunch of sewage <laughs> treatment plants in the United States have climate monitoring stations. And never mind the fact that there is heat released due to digestion right next to it in that big tank right there to the right. Oh, never mind that. And never mind that there's these air conditioners over there by the building. Oh, let's never mind that. This is in St. James, Minnesota. And on the next slide, you can see just how close it is to the building and the tank. Oh, and that big air conditioner unit over there. And it, it's like these weather stations attract air conditioners. It's crazy. It's just absolutely crazy. All right. So the next slide. This one is in Wyndham, Minnesota. Um, and it's in the back. It's wind sheltered. It's between three different houses. It is same kind of problem. Well within that 100 feet. Totally not fit for purpose for the measurement of climate change. Now, if you're just looking for weather extremes, that's one thing. But even with weather extremes, you know, what was the high and low or was it a new record? That's going to be biased too, particularly the low. The biggest problem we have with these stations is because these objects around them retain heat that has been absorbed during the day from sunlight and release it at night, it causes the low temperature to go up overnight at these stations. And that affects the average temperature, which they use to track climate change. And this is an ongoing problem. So here's another one. This one is at another sewage treatment plant in Worthington, Minnesota. They were doing a whole bunch of construction while I was there, but you can see it's just a few feet from the front of the building and also a few feet from the sidewalk. Um, seems like a perfect place to measure climate. This one is in Sibley, Iowa. That is the jail. That's where the inmates walk around out there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. So it, it, it's just it, that wall there that you see for the inmates and, and so forth at the sheriff's department, that's absorbing all that sunlight. Uh, and I tried to get an infrared photo of this. Unfortunately, I couldn't because my infrared camera was on the fritz that day. But you can imagine what this looks like in terms of, of the infrared. It's, it, you know, the thing would be very warm at night, releasing all that extra energy. Um, and, you know, let's look at the next slide. You can see how close it is to the street and the sidewalk. Um, right next to the sidewalk, not far from the street. You know, perfect place to measure climate change, right? Right, right next to the building. I mean, I could, I could toss underhanded to the building. Yeah, it's just amazing. It's and, surround. And, and, it's literally surrounded on all four sides by some form of concrete, or a brick, or yeah. brick. Right, and or and inmates. They get pretty hot sometimes. <laughs> hey, Anthony, we've got this one that I think would be appropriate to answer right now. Will this be posted on your website later? Sorry, say that again, Linnea. Will this be posted on What's Up With That later? Uh, at some point, results? yeah. Yeah, I have to do uh, a little bit of organization, but yeah. Um, now, I want to point out that this trip that I made, is, you know, some people will say, well, Watts went out and found the worst stations. He, he purposely went out and found the worst stations. No, not true at all. This was a random sampling based on a trip. I had to go from point A in Minnesota to point B in Reno, Nevada. And all I did was look at the map that NOAA provides for where these stations are placed and looked at stations that are within easy driving distance of the interstate, Interstate 80 in this case, and, and some other back roads. The bottom line is, is that I get, these were essentially a random sample of stations that were near the interstate and major roads that I traveled. I did not purposely seek out any of these stations um, other than the fact that they were available for me to photograph. So it essentially is uh, a random sample along a linear line across the United States. All right, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this one is uh, KRBX Radio. This is in... Um, Hold on here a second. O'Neill, Nebraska. And you can see off to the right there, there's the Stevenson screen and some satellite dishes. Yes, Nick Stokes will be upset. I don't give a damn. <laughs> I don't All know right. And so, 
we uh, yeah, the, Nick Stokes is one of the guys who's a commenter on WhatsApp with that, and and it, he's like talking to a piece of wood. I mean, you can show him any amount of data, any anything, and he will find a way to you know say, well, that's not relevant, you know. All right. Anyway, so KRBX. If we go to the next slide here, yeah, there it is. Stevenson screen, the MMTS temperature sensor, and of course, ta-da, an air conditioner. Right. Here's a better view of this, a little closer up on the next slide. And you'll be able to see just how close it is to the air conditioner. Gosh. It's like it's like five feet, less than five feet from the wall and the air conditioner. Yeah. yeah. And an electric pole, by the way. Right. Well, the electric pole doesn't or, or add a whole lot to it, pole. except that it's dark yeah. and it does absorb some some heat. But, you know... This is where climate change is being measured in the United States. And, but we are told by the experts at NOAA that none of this is relevant. We can adjust for this. Well, I call bullshit on that. The reason is that um, with 96% of the network being biased, how do you get rid of that? How do you, how do you sort that out? You can't, the bias is overwhelming. And the bias being overwhelming is basically creating a false signal. And the, yes, man-made climate change is based mostly on environment change, land use change, that kind of stuff. And that's what we're seeing again and again and again throughout the United States and also the world. It's just, it is a chronic problem. Yeah, when, 90, when, 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 when 96% of the data is polluted, you can't take 4% of the data and say, oh, we're going to average it with that. And that gives us a, a, a good signal, right? Yeah. There aren't enough good stations nearby all the polluted stations to do a, some kind of good adjustment. Yeah. And it, here's the thing. We took that remaining few percentage of stations, the good station. And by the way, I did find one, uh, a couple of good stations on this trip. I'll show them to you later. But. If you take the data from those good stations, the ones that are properly cited, and plot it, you will find that the rate of warming over the last 30 years is half the rate of the warming of all the other stations. Half. And so that basically takes, you know, the climate crisis and makes it a non-crisis. Of course, it was never a crisis to begin with. Climate crisis is just a marketing word, phrase. All right, let's go to the next one. This is Arnold, Iowa. Uh, no, Arnold, Nebraska. Uh, it's right near the street, not, right near convenient parking, um, right near a house. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, you can see just how close it is to the house. And it's just the same thing again and again and again. Now, why are these things so close to the house? Well, because they are installed by the National Weather Service technician who services the area. And they have huge areas to cover due to a consolidation of the National Weather Service in 1990. The number of National Weather Service offices around the United States was reduced by almost half. And as a result, they have less technicians covering larger area. So they have to go drive to these things, install these things, bury a cable, all this other stuff. And they typically go for the low hanging fruit of installation. They try to find a piece of grass and they put it there, like next to the jail in Sibley, Iowa. You know, they, yeah, we got it on grass. Woohoo! <laughs> You're not, you're not going to string a lot of wire farther from where you have to, you know, basically they don't want to walk very far. And no. the, the more wire you lay, the more wire, the more ground you have to dig up to lay wire, the more expensive it is. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll point out that inside they have an old style LED display device, uh, which they call the Nimbus which is basically just a display that shows the high and the low. It's got a memory for three days. It has a whole three days worth of memory. Um, it's based on 1980s technology. And we are still dealing with climate change today, the data being measured by old technology. Either it's, you know, in a Stevenson screen where they look at a thermometer, look at the reading, write it down, put it on paper and mail it in. Or it's on one of these MMTS devices where they've got an old style on a display, again, they have to write it down and, and, and either mail it in or they call it in by touch tone phone. In this day and age, we can do all of this automatically. We don't need this archaic labor-intensive system. Not at all. Now, well, I that, mentioned... Go ahead. 
the people recording are the other problem, right? If you're if you're a homeowner and they they set up this station next to your home, what you don't want is okay. Set it as far from my house as possible in uh, in Nebraska or Minnesota during the winter, and I'm going to trudge out to it through the snow and write down that uh, recording on the piece of paper and trudge back. No, you set that as close to my back door as possible, or I'm not going to get out there and do the readings regularly. Right. Exactly. And I will point out that when we had weather stations up on the dew line in the far northern reaches of Canada and Alaska, they did the same thing because they didn't want to take the risk of getting eaten by a polar bear. Put it close to the building where all that waste heat is coming out. Mm. Right. So I said I found some good stations. The next slide shows one of them. Uh, this one is um, at the Agricultural Research Farm in Nebraska. And as you can see, it's a standard Stevenson screen uh, to the left there. It's fenced in. It's out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it is well sighted as far as stations go. Next slide shows a different perspective of it. Uh, and this would be what we would call a class one station. Um, and the only bit of technology, you know, anywhere close to it is way in the background there, which happens to be a VOR for air navigation. Um, but, um, you know, they're still doing it the old way. And that main, that particular Stevens screen right there is well maintained. In fact, you can see the, the, the paint drippings on the stand where they've been maintaining it. They've properly maintained this shelter, uh, which is another issue. Some of these older shelters are not well maintained and they turn dark with age and that warms up the temperature. Pretty the next slide that. shows just how close it is to the road, but the road is not a problem because the road is dirt. Not going to cause any trouble. Sterling, you were going to say something? No, I'm just saying, saying uh, this, the one, uh, when I was doing work for your last report, uh, where four, four, four of the five were out of compliance, uh, the two Stevenson screens that I saw, they were both badly weathered. They had just, you know, the paint was chipping off. You had the gray wood rotting. Um, so that one, you know, was well maintained. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was surprised at how too. I was surprised at how poorly maintained one of the ones I looked at for you was when it was on a university property. Like there were actually, you know, it was like a it was like a research location for a university, and mm -hmm. it was sitting out in the field, and it seemed like it was relatively well placed, except for the concrete pad right underneath it. But, um, but it uh the the shielding or the box that it was in was like just black with with age and stuff and uh falling apart a little bit i think the door was like melting off so uh that was not so good the best one i saw was one that was at a um another like a small private college and it was just out in the middle of a nice big lawn um and it was like nowhere near anything, but that was one out of like five or six that I looked at as well. That was good. And the rest I went, were trash. I went to five stations, one of them in a major metropolitan area in Dallas County in Richardson, Texas. And it was the only one sited properly. I mean, no matter how much heat is going on around it, all around it, it was sited in a location that was far from the building, that was far from the alley that was far from the fence line it was the first one i went to i thought wow okay uh I, you know in my own mind i would think well just being in the city would bias it but but it meets the standard then i went to four other locations one in a small city in texas a, a small town uh and three in isolated rural locations and they were all poorly sited right next to buildings I mean, one of them mm -hmm. in the small city, it was it was literally you could park within four feet of it because it was a parking lot, a black asphalt park parking lot, a concrete parking lot on the other side, a building next to it, a small strip of 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 grass between the parking lot and the building. And that's where it was placed in a small strip of glass, grass about five feet, five feet or less wide. I, I could lay down and touch the concrete with my feet and touch the building with my hand. Uh, yep. The other ones were located, well, like you said, one of them was a radio station, right? Well, the radio stations do the news, but the, the radio station 
completely around it was a grass field. And it was within their fence line because they had they had it fenced off. So rather than sticking it at the back of the fence line or in the middle of the field, no, 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 no. Right, right next to the building. Yeah, and I, if I recall correctly, wasn't there an air conditioner, uh, heat exchanger not, unit in the back there? Not too far from it. And it was on like a, a little concrete pad. Sunken yeah. into the ground, uh, you I, know. So it, I was just amazed and appalled. The other one, I went to Joe Pool Lake. Uh, you know, it's it's a man made it's a man made uh, reservoir here in Texas. All, almost all our lakes are, um, and it's it's a uh, it it was Army Corps land. So they had acreage. They could have set it anywhere. They chose the one spot that was the worst spot to set it. It was right next to the maintenance building, you know, where the trucks park and their exhaust comes out and uh, it, it, on the concrete next to the building in a concrete, an entire concrete pad for, because it had, it had the, it had the uh, Stevenson, it had a different one and it had uh, other weather gear there. It's like they had, probably a thousand, 2000 acres they could have set this thing on. And they chose the one, one tenth of an acre postage stamp. That was the worst possible place they could set it, but it's the most convenient. Right. Convenience is important when you're measuring climate, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we've got a super chat here from our friend, Alan Griffiths, who says temperature statistics for satellites, oceans, and rural stations don't show any warming trends. It's only those from urban heat island stations that show warming. Um, I, I would, well, first of all, thank you very much for the uh, 10 pounds. That's wonderful. We're so appreciative of our audience. Thank you guys so much. Um, the people from England give us money. They, yeah, they, they do. They love every us. Week. <laughs> Um, they, uh, I, I would, I would say, I think based on the like U S climate reference network data that we do have, I think that there probably is a moderate, like a modest warming happening. Um, I wouldn't say there's no warming outside of urban areas. Yeah, no, uh, the, the, the satellites, the weather balloons and the, uh, the unbiased stations, uh, all, all show warming, but they show less warming. Right. Well, sometimes a lot less. Well, yeah. about half. About half. Yeah. So the point is, is that, like I said earlier, the best stations that we found, when we look at the trend over the last 30 years for them, they match the satellite record pretty closely. And yeah. so it suggests that the satellite record is is really spot on. Um, mm -hmm. But we still end up with this, this, this trash of temperature data. Now, you mentioned radio stations, Sterling. Here's a radio station in Ogallala, I hope I'm saying it right. Ogallala, Ogallala yeah, that's a Sioux, Sioux word. Yeah. Now, Lakota. this, uh, there it is. I, I visited this radio station, and in the back there, over to the left, is that beige building. And if we go back a slide or two, uh, you'll be able to see where it's placed, where the temperature sensor is placed. Okay, so there's this big, giant concrete parking lot and the maintenance building. And it's stuck in between there underneath the satellite dish. Now, the next slide shows it a little closer. Now, this underneath one is particularly satellite dish. Yeah, uh, this is particularly interesting because the MMTS sensor is shielded from the direct sun because of the satellite dish. So it's not going to get as warm during the day as it normally would uh, because the air around the sensor is not going to heat up as much. But at nighttime, all of that heat that's been absorbed from the sun, all that sunlight, that shortwave radiation hitting that concrete and the building and so forth. That's and the satellite warmer dish. at night. Hmm? I mean, I would I would suggest that the and the heat from the satellite dish that absorbs that's absorbed. It's metal. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it will. Yeah, it will also bias it at night. You're right there. Um, and so, what are we really measuring there? It sure as hell, it's not climate. It's not even weather. What are we measuring there? But this is the kind of incompetence in placement that we see time and time again throughout the United States in their, you know, their network of stations. It's just pathetic. All right. So the next one is Chapel, Nebraska. And I showed you the jail earlier. Well, it seems like Nebraska and jail seem to be a great place to measure temperature because in, this, in the next slide, 
you can see we've got yet again a jail where the inmates get to walk around. Oh, and by the way, notice closely, there's a barbecue there out in that jail pit. Apparently they let the inmates barbecue. And there's the temperature sensor over to the right. The next slide shows just how close this thing is to the backside. Hey, air conditioners, how about that? Wonderful, we love it. And a brick building facing to the west, wonderful. And the next slide shows, yep, there it is. There's the barbecue and the inmates. But it's on grass, right? So it must be right. Must it be would good. be interesting to me to know if they get a spike every time those guys are barbecuing in the temperature. <laughs> like, like yeah, if, 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 if the guy, if the guy, if the guy recording the data notices that if the barbecue is running, the temperature is hotter. Yeah. Well, we'll just we'll average it out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll adjust. We'll homogenize the data. All right. This one is in uh, Pine Bluffs, Wyoming, and I apologize for it being tilted. Um, I had a, a little difficulty with my phone at that moment, but you can see that this particular station is actually reasonably well sighted. This would be a class two station. They moved it away from the house, uh, and I suspect it had to do with the fact that the person who owns the, tr the house also owns a tractor, which you can see there to the left, and they probably helped with the trenching so that the NOAA National Weather Service guy didn't have to dig the deep trench all by himself using nothing more than a shovel, which is what they have to do with these places, right? So the guy probably trenched it himself, and he, he placed it equidistant between the house and the road. Some thought actually went into this one, but I suspect it had everything to do with the homeowner and nothing to do with the National Weather Service. Now, we talk about siting. So I installed one of our new weather stations as part of our global atmospheric open temperature system in Southwest Nebraska. And this is what proper siting looks like. When I put this station in uh, on land provided by one of our our, our Heartland uh, people. Who, yeah, this is out in the middle of literally nowhere. Literally nowhere. And I didn't see a single person or a vehicle or a building or nothing except for this way, way, way off in the distance. The next slide shows a couple of other perspectives of this. And you'll be able to see there is nothing around this station. Now, my design on this station has done what NOAA has not been able to do. I have designed an inexpensive, relatively, automated temperature monitoring system with triple redundant sensors, state-of-the-art communications, and one-minute reporting. It reports using the cell phone network. It goes back to a server and it logs all that data. And we'll be talking more about this in the future. But here I am, just this guy, you know, climate denier guy, uh, who's designed a station that is, exceeds everything that NOAA National Weather Service has done so far and done it on a budget. These stations delivered with shipping cost about 2,500 bucks. The closest one that NOAA has costs somewhere in the neighborhood of thirty to $40,000 and requires a huge amount of installation. Mine, you can ship it by FedEx or UPS, unpack it, set it up, following a set of instructions and it works. Now, our, our resident guinea pig, Sterling Burnett, has one of these and he's gonna set it up in Texas, right? Yep, I'm looking forward to working with hand tools. <laughs> my, my, my favorite, is, you know, when I was a young man, I actually took shop and learned how to work on uh, lawnmower engines uh, and I had to do a lot of my own car work because I didn't have money to do otherwise um, if I wanted to keep the car running. But that was sort of my goal as a young man was to eventually earn enough money in my life that I never had to do things I didn't enjoy doing. I had friends who liked working on cars and engines. I wasn't that guy. Still not. So <laughs> it will be, uh, you know, Sterling's big adventure. Yeah. in that field with uh, wrenches and screwdrivers and things like that, putting this th thing together. But yeah. you've sent the directions. I'm sure I can follow the directions. They're not uh, written yeah. in some Chinese foreign country where they drop verbs and, and, and things and a connects to C4 and stuff like that. So, 
we'll yeah. be okay. Right. Now, I want to point out, Sterling, that if you get frustrated and you can't make it work, it's not okay to shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we wouldn't, we wouldn't do that. Uh, yeah. That's what baseball bats are for. Yeah. By the way, for those of you that are technical, um, this particular picture here shows what some people thought when I showed it to them. They thought that that was an antenna up there at the top. Nope. It is a lightning rod. Why? Well, because this is this weather station is the highest point around for miles now. I mean, literally. And so uh, a lightning rod works by um, distributing charge into the atmosphere using something called the corona effect. The point of the lightning rod, and this was invented by Benjamin Franklin, dissipates charge into the atmosphere so that the differential between cloud to ground lessens. And as a result, it's not likely to be struck by lightning. We also have some minimal lightning protection built into the system, metal oxide barristers and things like that. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it, let's hope it doesn't uh, become a victim of the wrath of mother nature. All right, so I drove a little further. I went into Wyoming this time. Rawlins, Wyoming, the next slide, shows um, a conveniently located station right out on the front porch there uh, next to the satellite dish and the parking. And, uh, yep, it's just another volunteer who's got a station in its front yard right next to the street. You can see in the next slide, it's right next to the asphalt, right next to the bro the, the concrete wall, right next to the, the brick house that's uh, storing all that energy during the day. It's perfect for measuring climate change when you want to prove that things are heating up, right? Mm. All right, next slide. I drove a little further. This is Wamsutter, Wyoming. I've never heard of Wamsutter, but I found the station there, and it wasn't far off of Interstate 80. It's on this guy's deck, not far from his, his uh, you know, that little, I'm not sure if that's a smoker or a, a barbecue or a chimney or whatever, but you know, you can relax on the deck there. Uh, and I took, by the way, I did not enter people's yards. Every photo that you've seen here is from the street, you know, public, public, what you can see from the street. So, you know, we're not invading people's privacy. Here's another picture of this shows the, uh, the MMTS thermometer in proximity to the deck. You know, the deck is weathered. It's going to heat up with the sun because it's weathered, it's dark, and it's close to the house. Again, it's going to affect the temperature at nighttime. Not a great place to measure climate. Any thoughts, guys? Well, if I'm if I own that house, that's where my you know fire pit is and where my where I smoke my cigars. So uh, it's that's going to be a problem if I'm the guy. Hmm. Well. So I, I drove over to Rock Springs, Wyoming, not far down the road from Wamsutter, and they have it at the fire department there. And why do they have it at the fire department? Well, it was because the fire department is, is manned 24-7, 365, and they can write the temperature down and mail it in once a month, right? So the next slide shows where is the weather station, the thermometer placed? It's right next to a brick wall facing west. Woohoo! And there's a heat outlet there, some kind of a... Of a I don't know, chimney or something? I don't know. Uh, it's perfect. All of that sunlight hits that brick wall, absorbs it during the day, that energy, and then releases it at night. <laughs> oh, goodness. And it's the same thing again and again. Now, here's one that's not too bad, but it's still out of compliance. This one is in Evanston, Wyoming, further down the road on Interstate 80. I and know Evanston. I've stayed what, in Evanston. What's that? I know Evanston. I've stayed in Evanston. Great town. Okay. So this is at the um, the city maintenance yard. Uh, and they have um, a weather station there to the right, or pardon me, to the left, which has a, a sonic anemometer and an automatic rain gauge. And it's reporting uh, all of its data by satellite using that, that little antenna that you see there. But over to the center of the picture, we have the MMTS official temperature record. Um, and that is where they get the climate data from. They don't get it from that other station. That other one is probably for hydrometeorological purposes and so forth. Um, it's not a NOAA station. I suspect it's done through uh, some sort of a sub-network or maybe the university or whatever. And in the next slide, you can see that it's not far. The Both these stations are not terribly far from the asphalt, um, and they're in an area of unmaintained 
uh, wildland grass and so forth. It is on the edge of town at least, and so it's not in the middle of the UHI. But uh, if we go to the final picture on it here, you can see that it's next to a gigantic parking lot. And of course, that's gonna bias the temperature. And again and again, we find these things are next to parking lots and, uh, and so forth and so on. It's just amazing. So would that one be what you call a class two or three? Because it looks like on three sides, it's, it's okay, but on one side, it's really bad. Well, it's still, it, it might be a class two, unfortunately, because um, this, uh, this particular area here, I didn't have the opportunity to get out my tape measure and do any measurements. Um, I had to estimate, and I'll get this figured out from satellite photos later because I can pinpoint this. But it looks as if this particular station is, uh, the MMTS is less than 100 feet from the asphalt, more like 35 or 40 feet. So it might be a class two. Um, it's, it's hard to say, but it's certainly not in compliance because the asphalt is within 100 feet of the station. Right. All right, next station down the road, Wells, Wyoming. Uh, again, this is in somebody's yard, this picture I took from the street. And you can see it's, it's not terribly sighted, but it is, again, within 100 feet of the house and 100 feet of the outbuilding and so forth and so on. And the next picture shows that it's not too far from the bus stop either. Um, so what are they really measuring there? Same thing again and again, proximity to humanity. All right, then this final picture, next to final, this one had me puzzled. I sat, this is in the backyard of someone in um, Ilmay, I-L-M-A-Y, Nevada, which is just off of Interstate 80, um, not too far from uh, Lovelock, Nevada. Uh, there's a station at Lovelock that I photographed in 2022. But I looked at this and I looked at this and I'm trying to figure out what is that concrete thing right next to it at the lower part of the picture? And then it hit me. It's a burn barrel. That's where they're burning the trash. Then I peeked over the fence and sure enough, there was ashes. Concrete, piece of concrete uh, culvert turned up with a, with a screen on top of it. Uh, makeshift screens so that they can burn trash, which is a common thing in extremely rural areas because they don't have regular trash service. They have to haul it off to the county dump, you know, which might be miles away. So it's easier for them to just burn their trash than it is to haul it. And of course, that's the perfect place to measure climate change. And with that, I complete our slideshow. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. <laughs> what you a know, journey you've yeah. turned that trip that should have been relatively short into quite a long one so thank you so much for sacrificing your time to do that i know you get a little bit of uh what would they call it uh schadenfreude <laughs> a little a little <laughs> pleasure from documenting just how bad a lot of these are um but we have we have a ton of questions from sure. our viewers who are really interested to uh know what else is going on? We also have another super chat. This one is Euros. The Europeans like us, you guys. Uh, don't you need to calibrate every new measurement instrument? When are they replacing them? And this is from Greets from Belgium. Well, yes, you do. And no, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Lightning round. Okay, next. The Dubai flooding is being blamed on climate change, but they're have been many extreme floods in the Middle East over time. So is it really unusual for Dubai to be getting a once in a 100 year flood? Well, they had one about 75 years ago of similar or equal intensity. Um, and so what caused it back then? If, you know, was it climate change back then or is it just the fact that weather is random and occasionally, you know, things conspire to make a big, big set of rain? Um, you know, weather events, that's why we have 100 year floods or 100 year rainstorms. Weather is chaotic, and occasionally all the things combine together, just like a rogue wave in the ocean, and produce a, a huge weather event in one day. It's that's, not climate that, change. It's just the chaotic nature of weather. That's what I always wonder. Every time someone says, oh, we had a historic 500-year flood. Okay, so what you're telling me is 500 years ago, when there were no man-made causes, 
we had a flood like that. Oh, it's a thousand year flood. So a thousand years ago, when humans weren't burning any coal for electricity or any automobiles, you had a disaster like that. Yeah. Well, these are not. If it happened these before. Are not, these are not measured based on the last event. These are probabilities. These are probability calculations. The likelihood of this amount of rain falling in the space of 24 hours is likely to only happen within 500 years or 1,000 years. That's a probability estimate. It has nothing to do with the last one. Which is why we can get some in some cases thousand year floods two years apart, you know. Yeah, <laughs> but then, but, then it, but the probability tells you if, if there's a, a probability estimate, it tells you that there's a probability that this hat happens and has happened before and will happen again. Right. Right. All right. So we already kind of answered this question uh, from Gorilla R, who um, asks, "What's the state of the uh, goats project?" Or it's no. working on it. We got some pilots up. Well, I'm add? not going to get into that here. We don't have enough time, but we are ongoing right now. I would call it in late beta. Um, we're installing systems around the nation, seeing how they're working. And we have, as I said, our guinea pig here, uh, Sterling Burnett, who's going to set it up um, for himself. Now, Sterling admits that he's not good with hand tools. And so we're going to see how that goes. And then based on what we learn from Sterling, I'll adjust the instructions. And then we should be ready for anything. Okay. This question, I think, is a little bit tongue in cheek, but it says, does it matter where the stations are? Noah just adjusts the data anyway. <laughs> well, he had the point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I know. Um, well, I know we've got questions and I want to get to them, but I want to say one more thing. Yeah. It, it as, as it's come to light, you know, Anthony was interviewed for a story from the Epoch Times recently. And as it's come to light, it's not just that the stations that exist are poorly sighted. It's worse than that. It's that about a third of the stations they use don't exist at all anymore. <laughs> they, they keep re reporting data from sites that have been discontinued, and it's just made up from surrounding stations because they want continuity. Uh, continuity that, of record. The continuity of record. And so how do you get continuity? You pretend that the station is still there and you make up a temperature for it. Right. You interpolate the data from surrounding stations. That's and then that. It, I, it's hard for me to even call that science. It's not yeah. even science. It's statistics. And I, uh, I think and that. Can you imagine was, in a court of law, somebody doing this, yeah. you know, where they needed to have some data and the data was missing and they made it up from other data and presented it to the court. The judge would throw them out on their ear. Yeah. Well, well, the gun's not there, but we there were some guns in the vicinity, and we averaged it and said that's where the gun would be, <laughs> that they would be holding if the gun had been there, Your Honor. I think that goes to this question asked by uh, Chris here, which is, can you talk about the virtual stations where they estimate temperature rather than take actual readings? Is that really a thing? Yes. Yes, it is. It's really a thing. Okay. Let's see. Um, do you have enough temperature data to produce your own temperature trend statistics with the non-compliant station data excluded? Yes. And we've done this already. Uh, we had about 100 and 114, I think it was, stations that we found in the 2009 report um, that did not suffer from bias. And so when we plot the data from those 114 stations, it turns out to be about half the warming rate of the rest of them. Now, someone would say, oh, well, that's not enough stations to get a representative temperature for the United States or a representative trend. Well, I will point out that NOAA already established what's called the U.S. Climate Reference Network, and it has about 120 stations around the United States and Alaska. And they're saying that that number of stations is representative of the United States. So at 114 or so for mine, I would say it's pretty close to being representative. Yep. And this is this comes from that as well. Um, what is the rate of temperature increase for the USCRN and why don't we use that network? Well, it does not have a 30-year set of data yet. Uh, and to get a climate trend, you have to have 30 years. Of course, that doesn't prevent the media from making extrapolations. But 
the bottom line is, is that there's not enough data just yet. But if you look at the endpoints, you know, from when it was started in 2005 to what we're seeing in the past few months, there's not a whole lot of difference. There is some induced trend from El Nino that happened in 2015 and 2016, for example, which did affect the temperature of the United States. But when you just look at the endpoints, hardly any change, hardly any change at all between 2005 and the present. Okay, and then, hmm, let's see, another question. We've got this one. Okay, um, I was reading something the other day. CO2 levels are at 0.004%. Plant life dies at 0.002%. How true is that? That is fact check true to an extent, Peter Green. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than you just get down to that level and then all the plants die altogether because um, we've been very close to those levels before. Of course, those were doing, during some glacial periods where there were pretty large die-offs. So uh, it's not exactly a good thing to have carbon dioxide that low in the atmosphere. It's done, it's done by parts per million. And during the last ice age, uh, depending on during the depths of the last ice age, depending on, on how you measure it, uh, it, the Earth's parts per million, you know, through ice cores uh, and some proxy data, they estimate was 180 to 160 parts per million. At 150 parts per million, plants cease to photosynthesize. And so photosynthetic plants die. Um, and of course, if they die, everything depends on plants die. Oh, by the way, we depend on plants. Um, now, if you look at long, long history, what you'll see is that it's been a long drawdown of carbon dioxide. And they estimate, there, some have estimated that had we not come out of the ice age, because remember, the earth did warm when we came out of the ice age considerably. Um, and it released a lot of CO2. So even before pre-industrial, um, you know, even before industrial um, activity, it had gone from 180 parts per million to 280 parts per million before the first uh, internal combustion engine was ever turned over. Um, complete, 100% natural increase. And some people say that some of the increase since then is also still natural recovering from the ice age. But um, what we know is, or, or what the scientists estimate is, had we not introduced some CO2 into the atmosphere, if we weren't adding it in the next ice age, every, every ice age, the CO2 goes down even lower because slowly we are dr drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere. It's going into uh, carbonaceous rocks, limestone. It's, it's being compacted in the earth um, over time. and that's a danger. So one estimate I saw a few years ago was that in about 2 million years, um, absent human intervention, CO2 levels would have naturally gone below 150 parts per million. Yeah. So bottom line is, is that if we took all the CO2 out of the atmosphere, as some people advocate for, plant life would die and everything else would die following that. We've got this question, which I think is could lead to a good conversation here. If the stations are measuring the temperature incorrectly every year, but the temperature is rising, doesn't that mean the temperature is still rising? Uh, yeah. Well, the temperature. <laughs> I don't is, know what. On a year-to-year -year basis, the temperature is not always still rising. On a month-to-month -month basis, the temperature is not always still rising. Bottom line is, is that the bias introduced is systemic. And it gets worse in warmer years than it does in cooler years. Imagine, if you will. Uh, so let's say we have a year of low cloud cover, a lot of clear skies. And by the way, we've gotten clearer skies since the Environmental Protection Agency was put into place in the United States. Much of the United States has lost its smog. San Francisco, um, places like Los Angeles and San Diego, which used to have smog problems, don't have it anymore. So more sunlight gets through to hit, hit the pavement, hit the concrete, hit the buildings. That's more energy at the surface. With more energy at the surface, that retains more heat, and it causes the nighttime temperature to go up. We can see this effect in many cities throughout the United States through UHI measurements. So, yes, the temperature is still going up, but how much of it is real? How much yeah, how of it is man-made, localized? The, the growing heat island effect 
uh, because we are increasingly urban urbanizing around these locations. Also, but you know, th- another factor, let's be clear. It's not just that the urban heat island effect is um, increasing in places where we have these stations. It is also that they are going back and adjusting past temperature data from pristine locations and the adjustments always go upward. So places that were cooler and that are still cooler than exist today are warmer now on the official, the newly adjusted homogenized records than they were when they were recorded, making it appear that warming is happening uh, worse. Right, right. So we got any more questions, Linnea? I think it's time to wrap this up. Oh, yeah, we sure do. Let me pick through for a second here and decide what else we want to look at, because we've got a lot of good questions. Um, here's a good one from our friend Cowboy Roy Rogers. Can we get a video of Sterling's big adventure? And also, how would one in, uh, volunteer to install one of the monitoring stations further south in Texas? Well, um, I would say um, that's up to Sterling whether he wants to put himself on camera with hand tools or not. Uh, the only hand tool I like to put myself on camera is, is a firearm. Actually, I'm pretty confident with that. Um, but uh, I think you you tell me, Anthony, but if someone wanted to install one further south, if there was a volunteer down there that had some uh, the appropriate location, they should reach out and uh, to us and say, hey, I've right. got the site. Can we set up the station? Here's the criteria. If you don't have a piece of land with at least 100 foot clearance around it to any asphalt buildings or other biases, don't even bother to ask. We can't put it there. That's number one. Number two, it's got to have access to the cellular network there. You got to have a reasonable cell phone signal. So those are the two main criteria. Um, if you can meet those, then yeah, we can talk. We'd love to have, yeah, we'd love as many volunteers as possible. We want to set these things up all over. So if you, if anyone out there meets those criteria, let us know and we'll, we'll, we'll figure out something. All right. Um, let's end on a, a fun one here. We still have a couple more, but we're not going to be able to get to all of them because some of them are a little bit uh, trickier. But all right, here's a good one. Have scientists ever tried to block natural cloud formation to prevent rain? I don't know of a single case that I've ever read in the literature of such a thing. I, and here's the reason why I think that's probably not going to happen. Just because most of the time that's not desirable. <laughs> you don't want to induce drought. But I think that the energy involved to what, like suck humidity out of the air or, or change the composition of the atmosphere during um, an occasion where like precipitation would be more likely to happen, you know, changing that to that scale is something that's way different than um, spraying particulates of some kind, uh, up into the atmosphere in order to use them as nuclei for rain formation. Like that's a, that's a totally different type of technology that it would take. Um, and I can't even begin to imagine the scale of something like that. Well, you know, they, they, they're not, I don't hear them often talking about blocking cloud formation, but the, the advocates for really radical geoengineering are talking about trying to block the sunlight. Uh, you know, set up sh- sh- uh, sunshades in the in in space uh, to uh, block sunlight from getting through to to lessen it to lessen warming. That is a dangerous, dangerous thing. I can't I can't imagine that going wrong. Talk about mm. talk about uh, talk about mad scientists. Yeah, yeah. Next question. Oh, we have time for another. Okay, we'll do one more. One more. One um, more. Let's go this one from Bigfoot. We have, how about the ingassing and outgassing of CO2 into the oceans during periods of cooling and warming? Yep, the oceans are the big kahuna of carbon dioxide storage. Um, and it's just the same thing that happens to a bottle of soda pop. Everyone knows that if you take a bottle of soda pop, put it in the sun or put it in a car and then um, shake it up, open it up and you're gonna get an explosion. CO2 becomes less soluble in water or seawater the warmer it gets. And so if we have natural warming going on on the planet, it's going to outgas CO2 from the oceans. It's just that simple. And so without gassing of CO2, it provides a positive feedback. 
gets a little warmer as a result of that. Not much, because CO2 doesn't have that much of an effect at the current concentrations we live in, but it does have some effect. And so by contrast, when it gets cooler, more CO2 goes back into the oceans. Um, and we can actually see a respiration of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, every year, when you go to the Mauna Loa data, you can see that it actually goes up and then it goes down with the seasons. Or the overall trend is upwards. But the, uh, there is uh, a clear effect when it gets cooler, uh, mostly in the Northern Hemisphere. All right. I think that does it for today. Thanks, everybody, for all your questions. Thank you, Linnea and Sterling. Um, we'll have uh, an update on how Sterling does with his hand tools and system installation and um, go from there. I want to thank you all for joining us today. I'm Anthony Watts, Senior Fellow for Environment and Climate at the Heartland Institute, wishing you a wonderful Friday and a fantastic weekend. Bye-bye. He's a lion dog-faced pony soldier.